morning and welcome to Barton Church live on YouTube at half ten. Hopefully you're watching this at half ten. If not, if you're catching up, watching this later on on Sunday or another day, a massive, massive welcome to you. Welcome to our live stream. Welcome to those of you that your first time joining us here online. If it's your first time ever engaging with a church service, then we are so, so thankful that you are here joining us. My name is Ross and I am the youth worker here at Barton Church. And we are one church that meets over two locations physically. So we have Canterbury service at half ten, and then we have Faversham at 4pm. And of course, we have our online location as well. And we're all about transforming lives, communities and culture here at Barton Church. And this week is a big week for us in the church calendar, because today marks the start of our prayer week. That is right, one week of prayer. Loads of prayer stuff happening throughout this week, all um, culminating, if that's the right word to use, on a 24-hour prayer space here in Canterbury and 24-hour prayer opportunities in Faversham for prayer walks. And so today marks the day as it all starts. So I'm going to go through all the stuff that is happening this week and it will all be down here, hopefully, or here. You know, however the editor of this video wants to put it. Um, so you know what is coming. And if you want to know addresses, because some addresses are like home addresses, then all you need to do is head to our website and uh, sign up to our mailing list. And if, if you haven't really done that, then you'll get the addresses in that. But we have everything um, for adults, youth and kids for this prayer week. And we'd love for you to engage in as little or as much as you can. So first, for adults, and again, it will come up on the screen as well, so don't worry about it. I just have to remember what I am saying. Um, but we have, I've just got my piece of paper so I make sure. Um, tonight is our first prayer meeting on Zoom, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Monday, um, tomorrow that is Monday, we have another Zoom meeting, which is our, often our normal Zoom prayer meeting anyway. We're going to carry on with that, 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. On Tuesday, we have another Zoom meeting for those that want to get up early, 7 a.m. to 8 a.m., right before work time, right before taking the kids to school. You don't have to put the camera on, by the way, people, okay? If you don't want to, like, 7 a.m., you're still in your pyjamas, you're looking a bit ragged, that is fine. Just put, you know, just put no video on. But it would be great for, us, for you to join us whenever you can. And then Wednesday, we get stuck into our physical prayer meetings. So over in Faversham, if you're over at our Faversham congregation or Canterbury and you want to go over there, you have an opportunity for a prayer breakfast at the Jenkins. Again, we're not going to put their address here on YouTube, so you just need to get in contact with us so we can give you that. That is 7am to 8am. And then, if you wanted to, or again, or alternatively, there is lunch at Canterbury at 32 Barton Road, so that's actually our offices, and that is 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. On Thursday, we have our prayer walks, so we have uh, both at Canterbury and Faversham again, 12 p.m., 1 p.m. for both locations. If you are going to the Canterbury uh, prayer walk, we are meeting at the Sheep Coffee Place, which is in the bus stop, right? in, in the bus stop area. Grab a coffee, and we'll get walking, and we'll get praying. And for our Faversham site, we are meeting at West Faversham Community Centre, which is actually where we meet for our Sunday services. Um, and on our Friday, we have our 24-hour prayer space here at 32 Barton Road in the log cabin just behind me. And in Faversham, we're encouraging you to use that 24 hours. If any of you, anyone in Faversham wants to get up at 3am and go on a prayer walk, go for it and I'll get you a bag of Haribo, just let me know. But we're encouraging you guys or oh, anyone in our Faversham congregation to meet up with someone else from the Faversham congregation and head out on a prayer walk and just pray for the local community, pray for the other churches as well. So that is what's happening for the adults. And obviously, young people can join in that as well if they want to. For youth, normally for youth, this week is going to be a rest week, but we're having a one-off triple P night on Tuesday, um, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Again, I'm not going to say the address here on live on YouTube, um, but if you want to get that, go to that, I'll tell you a bit more about it in a minute, then just get in contact with us. Again, you can do that by going to our website. Um, this is the Triple P Night. So it's pizza, prayer and praise. So there's going to be an opportunity to eat pizza, opportunity to pray and opportunity to praise. And we would love to see as many our young people there as possible. And that is 6pm to 8pm on Tuesday. 
a triple P night. Pizza, prayer, and praise. And for the kids, we have designed, I say we, not me, Hannah has designed, Soraya has designed, and this is just like a little prototype, um, table placemats. They can be on a, they're on A3 table placemats, laminated, all lovely patterns, seven different um, days with seven different things to pray for that your kids can get praying into. Um, you can, it's all laminated and you can colour in all the patterns, or wipe it clean and redo it the next day. And that is something, again, for your kids to get involved with um, over the prayer week. So that is our prayer week, and we're super excited for you guys and the opportunities that you're going to get to be able to engage with that. We're excited for what God is going to be doing um, throughout the week in our prayer spaces, and we're excited just how we're going to go closer to God throughout this week. So, before we head in to our worship, um, I would love to just start this week of prayer with prayer. So why don't you join me in praying? Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given us as a church to come together to pray. And Father, we thank you for each uh, opportunity that we have throughout the week to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, to pray with one another, to lift up prayers of thanks, of um, requests to you. And we start this week, Father, um, humble. We start this week with humility. We start this week in repentance, in turning back to you. And we pray, Father, that you would, um, yeah, just renew our hearts this morning. That you would speak to us powerfully throughout this week. Father, we just pray for us as a church that this be a life-changing week. That each of us that engages in the things, whether with groups of people, whether just on our own or with families or friends, we would grow closer to you. That our hearts would be shaped and moulded towards the, towards the places you want it to be moulded to. We pray, Father, that you'd have your way this week. We pray, Father, that you would speak to us powerfully, that you would challenge us, convict us, that we would see your grace and see your mercy. Father, we bless you. We pray, Father, that you would bless us too. Father, we thank you for the worship, the sung worship that we are going to be singing this morning. We pray, Father, that it would be acceptable to you. We pray, Father, for pure hearts. We pray for our hearts um, not to be tainted by anything, but just for our eyes and our hearts to be focused on you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my soul Till I met you so You called my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glory now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old man 
Jesus when I met you and when you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glory stay you call my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glory stay needed rescue my sin was heavy chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan but you called me a citizen of heaven when I was broken you were my healing now your love is the end that I'm breathing I have a my eyes are open So when you call my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glory stay You call my name And I ran out of that grave Seal 
the promise your perfect body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me I came the morning that sealed the promise no blurry body began to Thank you, Wes, and thank you, Lydia, for that worship. We will be continue our worship later on. But now comes to the point of um, Oz, Oz's sermon that he has recorded for us. Um, I'm going to be reading um, the passages that he's going to be speaking on today. So there's a passage in Hebrews, which is easy to read. And then there's a passage in Genesis, uh, Genesis 5, with lots of names, which is probably going to be hard to read. So I do apologise in advance for any wrong pronunciations of names. Um, so here goes. So Hebrews 11, we're, st- we're continuing our series by faith, and today we are looking at Enoch. Um, so yeah, if you want to turn your Bibles to 11, um, Hebrews 11, I think it will come up on the screen as well. But we're going to be reading Hebrews 11, 5 to 6, and then Genesis 5, 1 to 32, and I'm reading from the NIV translation. So Hebrews 11, five to six, and it says this. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And then we're going to quickly move to Genesis 5, Genesis 5, 1 to 32. This is the written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And he named them mankind when they, when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, He had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years, and then he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. After he became the father of Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had um, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Seth lived a total of 912 years, and then he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he became the father of Kenan. After he became the father of Kenan, Enosh lived 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enosh lived a total of 900 years, and then he died. 
When Kenan had lived 70 years, he became the father of Mahalalel. After he became the father of Mahalalel, Kenan lived 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Kenan lived a total of 910 years and then he died. When Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he became the father of Jared. After he became the father of Jared, Mahalalel lived 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Mahalalel lived a total of 895 years and then he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. After he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and, other sons and, and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived a total of 962 years and then he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. After he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had, um, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Methuselah lived a total of 969 years and then he died. When Lamech, Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah and said, He will comfort us in the labour and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. After Noah was born, Lamech lived 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Lamech lived a total of 777 years, and then he died. After Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So, let me just pray, and then we'll listen to Oz's talk. Father God, we thank you for Oz. We thank you for the gift that you've given him. Uh, we thank you for the time that he's put into this talk. Uh, we just pray now, Father, that he would speak powerfully and boldly and with confidence. And we just pray, Father, for our hearts, that they will be softened, that our ears, our eyes and our mind and our heart would be opened as well to you. Father, help us listen well, help us engage well, and help us apply this to our lives too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today in our By Faith series, we're looking at Enoch. And as we think about Enoch, I want to start by thinking about family trees. Have you ever done your family tree? Or maybe you've had a friend or a family member that have begun that process. And uh, a few years ago, that's what we thought we would do. It didn't get very far because we soon quickly discovered that it's quite hard to do a family tree. It took quite a bit of research, took quite a bit of time. But what it did generate was some great discussions about family, not just immediate, but more distant. Um, my wife Nadia, her family, uh, seems to be uh, sort of built on artists and architects and a certain style of, uh, of uh, expertise and work, which is really interesting. Um, the, what, the, the lampposts that have been constructed along the Thames with a sort of fish symbol in them uh, were made by Nadia's Relative, distant relatives. So there's one interesting fact that came out of our conversation and another being one of her aunts had a pet monkey. Bizarre. Uh, maybe if you look back into your family history, your lineage, you'll discover interesting quirky facts that would be good for uh, around the table discussions um, and bring a smile to your face like that. But often we don't know an awful lot about the people that have gone before us. Maybe our immediate uh, grandparents, um, but beyond that, it's quite hard. Certainly for my family, it's got a bit lost and there might be one or two members of the, the family that know a bit more, but otherwise, less so. But where we look back and see who's gone before us, we understand more about the cultural influences on our family lineage, we think more about our ethnicity or about our influences, maybe about others that have had faith in the past that has meant that we too have faith today. All sorts of interesting things. And as we look at Enoch, one of the things that we're going to see is it's important to understand a backstory. What's your backstory is an interesting question. 
But what is Enoch's backstory is where we're going to start. And he's one of those names that come in chapter 5 of Genesis, as we've heard read, that is in the middle of a list of names that sometimes are a bit hard to pronounce and are a bit unfamiliar to us. One or two names maybe pop out. Methuselah, Enoch's son, the oldest person ever to have lived, according to the records in the Bible. And you might think, well, how, how is looking at the genealogy of Enoch helpful? But biblical genealogies are really important. They're significant. They're placed in the Bible at key moments, Genesis, and even in the Gospels like Matthew and Luke, for a purpose. And um, if we assume that every name is the exact uh, next ancestor, then we're misunderstanding how biblical genealogies work. Occasionally there might be a skip in a generation to make the point of a significant ancestor. And so genealogies were used to not only record key figures and the line of people historically, but also to emphasise a purpose, to point somewhere and to someone of significance. And to see that we're connected to others. We're not just born and live and die in isolation, but we're a part of a bigger picture, a bigger story. And that is one of the messages through the Bible that we discover. But one of the questions that you might have in mind is, well, it's all very well having read this in chapter five, all these different names and these ridiculously long um, lives that people lived up to nearly a thousand years. But Maybe that's a bit of an obstacle for you. How on earth can you believe that people live to 960 odd years? Um, that's just a bit ridiculous and far-fetched. That's one of the reasons maybe that in the past you've struggled with believing what the Bible says. Or maybe other people have said that to you and said, well, I've got to disregard this because look, it claims, its claims are just so unrealistic. They're not compatible with modern science and understanding and um, our way of of understanding the aging process. So how could people live to nearly a thousand years? That's the question. Well, I think there's two ways we can read these verses. One is they're symbolic. They're symbolic. The number seven comes up a few times. Um, if you look at the numbers of ages and you do a bit of maths, you can kind of arrive at certain points to go, oh, this represents time periods or significant numbers have meanings that are symbolic. And people have done that. They've analysed the ages, they've looked at the patterns, they've used the number seven, for example, done some adding and multiplying and arrived at a conclusion to say this is what it's about. And actually, in some parts of the Bible, that's very much the case. Books like Revelation, we see the numbers that are used really significantly to make a point. The number of three or seven or ten or twelve. Um, is that the case in Genesis 5? Maybe, maybe not. We can't say for sure, but there's a fair argument in that direction. Either way, there's a, a narrative, a story that's unfolding through these key figures and their long lives. But maybe another way of looking at it is literally, and that might be the one that most people think, oh, I'm not sure about that, or, or do we just take it at face value? Um, actually, other ancient cultures also had traditions of longevity in ancestors. Uh, and following the creation, it's maybe more understandable that people lived longer before the onset of decay and disease and the other things that seem to uh, speed up the aging process and cause death eventually that we're very familiar with today. And actually, by the time we get to Moses, who lived um, near 120 years, suddenly this, this cap, this limit, which biblically is expressed, seems to be the case. So there's an argument for the literal. Other cultures, ancient cultures, had similar um, accounts of people living really long number of years, but also maybe there's the impact of the initial creation and then gradually the decrease. Um, either way, the main question is not, is it literal? Is it symbolic? But why? Why have we got it there in the book of Genesis? Why has the Holy Spirit inspired the authors to use these numbers? What, what's going on? And I think the main point actually we find through the chapter is that people live however long that may be, but they also die. Death is seemingly inevitable. Death is a part of the, the consequence of the fall of man, the sin 
of the in the Garden of Eden has led to not just life and creativity and development and the spreading of people, populating of the earth, but also the reality of death. And chapter five reveals that in a way that maybe chapter four hadn't, because in chapter four we see the, the first family unit striking out and Cain killing Abel. And we see the, the way that spread through the line of Cain. And we get to chapter five and we don't just see it spread through people being violent, but we see it happening as a normal part of life now. Death is a certain event that will happen. And yet, right in the middle of that, we come across this guy, Enoch, don't we? In chapter five, and in verse 21 to 24, we read this. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God faithfully. 300 years, and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years, so significantly less than the people either side of him. Not six, seven, eight, nine hundred years. 365 years. It's an interesting number. Um, and at the age of 65, beginning a family. And then Enoch walked faithfully with God. We get an interrupt interruption in the pattern that's been presented of people uh, living a certain number of years, being the father, um, having more sons and daughters, and then dying. And here we get faithfully walked with God. And then Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. Well, no death. A break in the chain. Somebody that didn't quite fit the pattern that is the norm for humanity. One that walked through death as he walked with God. Suddenly we begin to see that there's a message in the middle of this genealogy that's relevant and gives hope and gives promise as the Old Testament is beginning to unfold. The, the promise of a, a seed, an offspring, coming through the line of Adam, giving hope to the people that were rebelling and wicked and sinful. And suddenly we come to Enoch, an example of faithfully walking with God, of being given life and not suffering death. And so as we look at Enoch, we might think, well, what else do we, we know about him? And actually, these three verses in Genesis are, are pretty much it in the Old Testament until we get into the New Testament, where Enoch's referred to in Luke chapter 3, another genealogy, and then right uh, at the end of the Bible, in the book of Jude, when there's a passing reference to this individual called Enoch. And, and beyond that, we, we don't know much. And yet, I think there is a lot that we can learn. And so as we think about him, we're going to think about... Enoch's backstory and then we're going to think about his life story and how that can impact us as we seek to live lives that walk with God through whatever may face us. And so as we start by doing that we're going to think a bit about chapter 4 and from verse 17 to 24 of chapter 4 we are told about Cain and the way that his line developed and his line went actually his son was also called Enoch but it's a different Enoch um, Enoch's son is not the Enoch that we're thinking about today mainly. And following that in verse 17, there's a line that develops um, through Cain and ends up with a guy called Lamech, who represented vengeful passion. If Cain was a, a sinful murderer, um, then Lamech seems to be even more of a sinful murderer. And in fact, what we see is Cain's line representing death, uh, wickedness, evil, vengeance, bigamy in Lamech's case, as is explained in the end of chapter four. Things are going in the wrong direction. God's beautiful creation seems to be falling apart. And we're in chapter four. Where is the hope? It's certainly not with Cain's line. It's certainly not with Lamech, who represents all the things that are against what God had intended for his humanity. But then people began to cry out to God, it says at the end of chapter four. And we're introduced to an individual called Seth. And Seth is the replacement, as it were, for Abel. And so Adam and Eve have another child and Seth will also have a line. And seven sons following that, where do we get to? We get to Enoch, that key number seven. And the seventh line of Cain was Lamech that represented vengeance and 
passionate, evil intent. And here, the seventh line um, in Seth's line, who do we get? Enoch, who doesn't die, who represents faith, who represents life, who gives hope in these dark times of increasing death and wickedness and the falling apart of humanity. So as we think about the backstory, we suddenly understand that Enoch came from a line that was to represent hope, that the seed, the offspring, the one that would be the serpent crusher in, in Genesis 3.15. Maybe there is hope, maybe there is one that will come, that God's purposes will be achieved, that the evil of the world will be overcome as the, this promise develops and gain substance in the character of Enoch. And is Enoch going to be the one? Is he going to be the great saviour Messiah? Well, we know from the rest of our Bible that that's not the case. But what we do know is that he is a forerunner. He is somebody that runs ahead, pointing even further into the future for us, but giving us an example of what it looks like to live by faith, faithfully walking with God. And so the backstory matters because it points us to the main purpose of Enoch, to live as an example, to embody life to come. And interestingly, after, after um, Enoch, he, he had the, the child that lived the longest, according to the biblical records, Methuselah. And then um, not long after came another Lamech, not from the line of Cain, but from Seth. And what was he like? Was he also this vengeful, passionate um, murderer and um, person or, or not? Well, well, no, he's not. Lamech fathered Noah, the one who would be the bringer of rest, of peace, of hope, the one who would construct an ark and provide salvation to those that look to God in faith. So we have two backstories, the backstory of Cain uh, or, or of um, from Lamech all the way back to Cain uh, and also of Enoch from Seth through to Enoch, through to Lamech, through to Noah. There is hope. There is life. So as we look back, how does Enoch's life help us look forward? To live for God faithfully. To be people that please God, like it says in Hebrews. I'll remind you again of those Hebrews verses. So if that's what Genesis 5 reveals, what does Hebrews 11 verse 5 say? It says, by faith. Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And so Enoch is this character who pleases God, who walks faithfully, who fathered sons and daughters, one of whom was Methuselah from the age of 65. He became a dad. He had a family unit and he lived for some 300 years before being taken to heaven. Quite how, we do not know. We're not told, we can speculate. But what we do know is that he did not die. He, he was taken like Elijah in King, the book of Kings, um, up to be with God as a reward. Why? Because he pleased the God that he had faith in. And so I want to pull out a couple of things about Enoch's life and then see how we can apply them to our situations today. And the, and the first thing to recognise and the question we might ask is, how did Enoch walk with God? What did that look like? Was that kind of literally walking? Was that this is this is a metaphor? And actually throughout the Bible, the metaphor of walking with God is quite common. It means living with God. It means knowing God. And so you can walk with God by being sat on a sofa, by maybe you're unable to go for walks like many people can and do. Um, you're not excluded from this. Everyone can walk with God if they look, live by faith, if they relate to God and know God and seek to grow in pleasing him. But walking with God, this really powerful metaphor of journeying with someone is used and we might wonder how that even happens because this was before the Ten Commandments, this was before the tabernacle or the temple. What did it look like to know a God that hadn't been revealed through sacred writings and a, um, scrolls, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible? Well, 
There had been a, an awareness of the created order, creation and nature. There had been a, the, his conscience being aware of right and wrong and the oral traditions from his lineage and backstory of the creative God, uh, great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve. And so there was awareness of God and yet there was a choice to call to him rather than to live for self like many did. And so we see faith, trust, hope in, in a creator God, a God who sets out a purpose, a God who calls us to pray, to speak to him, to listen to him, to be with him, to know him and discern his character. And so walking, living with God for Enoch was about earnestly seeking to please the creator God, it was looking in faith and recognising he needed more than what he could figure out in his own mind. He needed a God that was loving and good and had a purpose. And that impacted his ordinary life. And that's uh, the first thing I want to highlight, really, really, is that Enoch's faith was expressed in ordinary family life. Enoch's faith was expressed, was, was, was shown through the ordinariness of life. And for him, what is really interesting in chapter 5 of verse 21 is that it says, When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years. Why did it say that? After. Well, maybe that was a key turning point in his life. It is for any parent, isn't it? If you're a parent, you'll know that the change in your perspective on life when you have your first child, the tiredness, the, the reordering of priorities, the sleeplessness, the concerns and fears and worries about whether they're growing or not, whether they're going to learn to walk ever, whether they're going to be able to feed themselves rather than be fed, whether it changes so many things about how we look at life and how we experience life. But more than that, it's a critical point to ask ourselves, what is life really about? And as a child is born, it is one of those moments that is a bit of a revelation to us of the creator God, of the trust we maybe need to put in him um, rather than the fear and anxieties that we have over the potential loss of a child or the fear of what might happen to our child as they grow up. And so for Enoch, this turning point, becoming a father, seemed to come at the same time as being somebody who seriously walked with God, sought God, aimed to please God. I don't want to put too much extra into that because it would be speculative. But what we can see is this correlation, can't we? And I wonder whether that's true for you. Have you ever experienced a sudden change in your life that has led to growth in your spiritual walk? Maybe that was becoming a parent. Maybe that was how you, you changed the system and way of, of living because of your child. And you thought, right, from this point, I am going to start getting to my Bible and praying more because I want to know what God says about how to parent a child. I want to grow spiritually so that I can grow my, my, my son, my daughter up in the ways of the Lord. I want to dedicate my child so that I promise before others to do so. I want to put church in the diary in a way that I haven't before. I want to seek to live God, not just on a Sunday, but every day of the week. In fact, often when we become parents, it can be really hard to be a, a godly parent. Um, we're, we're tireder, probably means we're more impatient. Um, we're probably less able to keep our rhythm of Bible reading because life is just chaotic and so many things happen unexpectedly. Just as you sit down to read your Bible, suddenly a nappy needs to be changed or, or you're rushing off to work and um, it's really hard. And in fact, I know many parents within Barton Church have struggled to, to figure out how do they grow, how do they walk with God faithfully through the early years of parenting. And the challenges just change, don't they? As you, you raise children through the primary age uh, where, where there's lots of demands and support and care rightly needed. And through the teenage years where things change again. How do we be growing in our walk faithfully through the years? And these are the conversations that are so key to have with one another in our church. To, to, to share experiences and um, tools and resources and ideas and to pray with one another how to grow in our parenting.
But maybe parenting isn't your situation. Maybe there's been a different change in your circumstance, a new job, or a new house, or a new friendship group, or, 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 or an illness, or the loss of a loved one, or some other circumstance that suddenly changed your experience in life. Whatever has suddenly changed, for Enoch, it appears that that correlated with faithfully seeking God, walking with God. And I, I think this is a great example. Tom. How can we live by faith? Well, let's get serious when our circumstances change. And if your circumstances are fairly stable and there's not a lot of change, of course, we all need to constantly evaluate our walk with God. But it happens in the ordinary. Family life is an ordinary thing. Work is an ordinary thing. Friendships and rhythms in life, the ordinary spaces. And for 300 years, Enoch seemed to faithfully walk. Now, that can bring its own challenges, living life in an ordinary, familiar sense with God. And yet, that is the norm. Often we, we look for the spiritual highs, the moments, the, the, the miraculous and they're often far and few between, aren't they? God calls us to be faithful, first and foremost, in the ordinary spaces in our lives. Second thing that I think we see from Enoch is that as well as his faith being expressed in ordinary family life, his faith is experienced in deep communion with God. He seems to model to us one that walked closely with God not just in the, necessarily the family environment, but had an had a awareness of God, a depth of relationship, a communion with him, a walk with him that was intimate and close and growing and steady and a great example of faith through life, which led somewhere. And in the end, as we've said, it led to not death, but life as a reward with God forever. Wow. Faithful living and the reward, as Hebrews says, because of his faith of life with God forever, escaping death, cheating death. He walked with God through life and death. So what do we learn from that? Well, I think one thing we, we realised, first of all, that it was a walk. And a walk is not a run. It's also not being stationary and still, is it? A walk is a steady, quite slow pace, three miles an hour. Um, there's, a, there's a book that's been written called The Three Mile, Mile Per Hour God by a Japanese theologian called Kosuka Koyama. And um, as a staff team, we looked at just a, a short chapter of that and it had been recommended by one or two people to me. And what's really challenging about that book is that it reminds us that God walks with us at the pace of roughly three miles an hour. Now, um, what we mean by that is that in the slow, the steady that alongside companion-like journeying. He's not ahead, racing ahead, saying, come on, catch up. He's with us through the trials, through the hardships, through the great times, but steadily always there, like a walking companion. Through the highs and lows, through the struggles and the joys, he's with us. And often we can feel like we need to race ahead if we're living by faith, we're being active, we're being... Um, activists we're eager to constantly do 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 but when you walk with someone you're with them you're present you be you don't really do much other than put a foot in front of the other and talk you listen you care you intentionally are with one another and so Enoch here is experiencing deep communion with God which maybe for us is a challenge how can we grow in our deep communion with God? How can we really know him in prayer? How can we really know him in his word? How can we really know him when we suffer and when we struggle and when we're in a trial? How can we really exercise faith? Well, that only happens as we carve out time with him that's not just in the busy, ordinary hustle and bustle of life, but also is set aside and seeking an experience of God that is deep and transformative and a real encounter with the living God. Now that's not the basis of our faith but it's a part of our faith and it's something that seems to have pleased God as he looked on Enoch, saw that he faithfully walked with God 
and rewarded him greatly. Um, Eugene Peterson says this about walking with God. He says, it's long obedience in the same direction. Long obedience in the same direction. Actually, that's what faithful walking with God, living with God looks like. Faithful living looks like walking with God, long obedience in the same direction. I think that's a powerful phrase. And so what does that look like for us? How do we begin to explore that? And just before I come on to that, I think um, what we need to see is where Enoch's life, backstory and life story point. And they point to one um, that we know to be our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And they, they point to him because Jesus was the ultimate pleaser of the, the God of the Bible. He, in John eight twenty nine said, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. It, all the characters of faith in Hebrews 11 point us to the perfectly faithful one, Jesus. And as they are an example to us, they're also a pointer to us of the one that doesn't just live by faith, but saves us by pleasing God, by going obediently to the death on the cross. And then what we find in John 11 speaks volumes to us as we seek to live to please God. It says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? That's what Jesus says. He says, believe in me and you won't die. Believe in me means active faith, means faith that is walking with God through all the different aspects of living that we have. Ordinary family life, work life, special communion with God, personal space with God, public corporate worship. As we do that, we please him. And as we believe in him by doing these things, he says, you won't die. Enoch did not die. He went to be with the father. We might physically die. But the great news for us is that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in him will not die. All death is, is taken away of the physical experience of our body now. And yet life with God forever is the truth of the resurrection. Physical bodies that are upgraded, that are new, that are without disease and pain and no more tears and crying. The new creation, the joy of life with God. That's where Enoch points us. And so as we finish up with a few application areas, I want us to just uh, just very briefly look at a few verses in the book of Jude. And in verse 14, it says this, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict, convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their, dis for their advantage. This is the people that Jude was writing to and he's saying Enoch warned um, that God would judge this kind of living, this kind of wickedness. And then in verse 17, but dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are people who divide you, who follow their natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit to keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Enoch is an example of faith to us. He's also a warning and he was in his days of sinful wicked living and he says God is a God who saves but he's a God who judges wickedness and we know that's coming in chapter 6 and 7 and 8 of Genesis with the flood but here the letter of Jude is, is, right, is saying to us, look, there's wickedness around. And like Enoch warned, so be warned of the consequence of ungodly living. And instead, build yourselves up in the holy faith. Here are, here are four steps for you to think about this week. One, how are you building yourself up in faith? The step of faith, the holy step of faith is about growing in your walk. 
walking with God in every area of your life, your family life, your work life, your personal life, your social life, how are you growing in faith? Maybe that means getting serious about reading the Bible. Maybe that means getting more serious about prayer and listening and interceding for others or about witnessing to others or about doing work with integrity and challenging a culture of of gossip in the office. Step two, prayer. Uh, we, We read there, didn't we? You most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Walking faithfully has to involve praying in the Spirit. Praying not just like a ritual because it trips off our tongue, but with authenticity, with a genuine love for those him whom we're praying to, in the spirit. This is a spiritual activity and exercise of listening, of speaking, of pouring out our heart. And we've got a prayer of week coming up this week. How can you pray in the spirit this week? How can you get involved and sign up to something and set aside time to pray in the spirit and grow in deep communion with God? Step one, faith. Step two, prayer. Step three, this is another holy step, love. How, how do we do these things just active and, and it's our actions and our faith and our reading and our prayer? No, because keep yourselves in God's love. That's our identity. We are loved. And as we are loved, we respond to God's love with love. And so we seek him and we grow in him. And step four, hope. Step four, hope, because as we do these things, we are waiting for his return. We are waiting for the life that Enoch experienced. One day you can experience that. One day I will experience that if we seek God in faith and receive his saving love. And so this week, how can we hope as we pray? How can we hope and not be discouraged by the circumstances of life? Walk with Jesus and he will walk with you through death. That's what we put our hope in. That's what pleased God about Enoch. And that's what will please God about you and me. As we exercise faith, prayerfulness, love and hope. Amen.
are here, you are holy, we are standing in your glory, you are here, you are holy, we are standing in your glory, you are here, you are holy. Thank you Oz, thank you uh, Wes and Lydia for that response song as well. And as we just bring this service to an end, as we bring this live to an end, I just would love to pray for you guys. And I'd love for us to respond in prayer. And as Oz said, there is kind of four steps that we can take this week, take into our lives. Faith, prayer, love and hope. And maybe you need to take all four steps. Maybe you just need to take one, or two, or three. Maybe you just need to focus on one this week and then focus on another the next. But what do you need in your life at the moment? What steps do you need to take? Do you need to take a step of faith? Do you need to take a step into prayer? Do you need to take a step into love? Or do you need to take a step into hope? What is going on in your lives? And what do you need to focus on? What is going on? Do you need faith? Do you need prayer? Do you need love? Do you need hope? Whatever that might be, God knows. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what you need. And maybe you can use this week of prayer to step into those things, to step into what it might look like to step into faith, to step into what it might look like to step into a rhythm of prayer, to step into what it might look like to love to step into what it might look like to live in hope. So whatever it might be, I would just love to pray for you this morning. Maybe you want to change your posture, open your hands out wide, receiving posture. Maybe you want to be on your knees. Maybe you want to be standing up with your arms in the air. Maybe you just want to be comfortable, laid back, laying on the floor, whatever. But maybe you want to think about changing your posture this morning as we come to God for this week of prayer. And as we come in response to what others just said, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Oz's message. Father, I thank you for the challenge that it brings. And I just pray now, Father, for uh, us, for those that are watching this live stream. I pray, Father, for those that need faith, for whatever they are going through. Maybe it's faith that you would do something. Maybe it's take a faith that they need to accept. They need to have faith in you. Father, this morning I pray that you would increase that in them. That you would increase faith in those people's lives, in those people's hearts. And Lord, maybe it's prayer. Maybe people need to step out into prayer, to pray bold prayers, to pray prayers that they've been praying for years and years, maybe to pray prayers they're scared of praying. Father, I just pray that they would use this week to pray. And Father, that you would comfort them as they pray. 
that they would have a they would have a sense of your presence and closeness as they pray. And Father, I pray for those that need uh, need love, for those that need to show love. I pray, Father, that you would reveal to them firstly your love, that you would remind them of your love. And from that, Father, I pray for those people that they would be able to act out in love. That they would be able to have a heart that is ready to receive your love. And Father, I just pray for those that need hope. Hope that a situation will get better. Hope that something will happen. Father, I just pray this morning and I pray that throughout this week, that they would grasp a little bit more of the hope that you give us, that the hope that you give them. Father, I just pray now for all those that are watching. I just pray, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit in those places that are watching this live stream. Father, we just pray that your presence would be tangible. We pray, Father, that you would be um, comforting powerfully, speaking powerfully, loving powerfully. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. And Father, we just thank you again. That as you come to the beginning of this prayer week, we pray, Father, that you would be honoured, that you would be glorified through us. And may every prayer meeting, whether it's during the times that we've organised or just when we go out on our own, that you would be at the centre, that you would be speaking to us powerfully. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, that brings an end to our live stream. I know today's a little bit different. Next week we'll be back live in Canterbury. Um, but once a month you're going to get one of these, uh, which is really cool as well. Um, do remember to engage in as much as you can throughout this week for um, our prayer week. Remember what is happening for the adults. Remember what is happening for the youth night, the triple P night, pizza prayer and praise, which I'm buzzing for. Um, and do remember, if you have kids at home and you haven't been able to get to any of our sites, either Canterbury or Faversham, again, do get in contact with us and we can get you a placemat to you. Either we'll post it or deliver it to you. Um, but we're super excited about this prayer week and we hope you are too. That draws an end to our service. I hope you have an amazing rest of your Sunday, whatever you are doing. Have a great time and I'll see you next Sunday. Barton Church. My name's Nadia and I've got the privilege this week of doing the Barton in the Week video. Um, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to tell you about something that's new for me in my week, um, which is my involvement with the Canterbury Christian Schools Work Trust, CCSWT. Catchy, isn't it? Um, and uh, you may be aware of this charity, you may not be, but this is a charity that the church um, financially give to and a charity that many people over the previous years have been involved with. Um, either as a mentor or supporting financially or um, uh, going into schools and being part of. So um, the Canterbury Christian Schools Work Trust it was set up with a view to um, support the local schools um, and to uh, be a Christian witness in schools. So um, at the minute we have uh, a primary worker, Katie, a secondary worker, Lou, and from the start of January, I've also been employed as a secondary worker. Um, so I too will be going into schools and doing some one-to-one -one mentoring and running some group work for um, young people in schools that just need um, a little bit of space, a little bit of time to help them to um, work through some emotions that they might be uh, struggling with and to help them to build resilience, build confidence um, and to um, build their self sense of self-worth. Um, so this is all new for me and I would love for you to pray, pray for me, but also pray for the organisation. Um, it is just incredible that um, a Christian organisation is welcomed into local primary and secondary schools. 
Um, and I would uh, love for you to um, pray that that would, be, would continue as time goes on, that we would have that openness. Um, pray too for Christian staff and um, pupils in schools. We've got a number of them at Barton. So um, yeah, let's be praying for them. Um, particularly at the moment when they've got mocks and exams coming up. Um, pray also for, um, yes, Lou and Katie and myself as we go into schools. Um, pray for us as we do the group work, as we uh, sit one-to-one -one with young people and children. We also have the chance to do prayer days occasionally, um, focus days on different topics, um, and also collective worships, which is the word for assemblies. Um, so yes, uh, I would love for you to um, be praying for us, but also pray for the organisation, pray for our local schools. In the lead up to the prayer week, it's a great way to, to be involved. Um, if you would like to know more about the Canterbury Christian Schools Work Trust, then please come and find me on a Sunday or send me an email, uh, drop me a message. Uh, we have a regular news and prayer letter that's sent out every term as well that you can access to find out more about what we're doing. Um, or yeah, come and chat to me. I'd love to tell you more. Thank you.